This is Carolina gold. It's not gold and it doesn't come from the Carolinas. It's actually rice. Rice native to Africa. But then how did it come to America? And how in the 19th century did it become so crucial to America's economy that it was likened to gold? Whose genius converted thousands and thousands of unusable marshy southern acres into rice plantations, a feat compared by many in the American South to building the pyramids? What you're about to hear, you won't hear anywhere else. Not like this. So please hit that like and subscribe button before I introduce you to the Gullah Nation. When you think of rice and its origins, you probably think of East Asia, places like China, Japan and so on. But what most don't know is that West and Central Africans had been growing a better, more durable type of rice species thousands of years before Europeans brought today's more popular Asian rice to Africa. This African rice is known by the technical name Oritsa glabarima. It looks like this. Look closely. Do you see it? That beautiful yellow husk. You might even say it looks like gold. Well, once that golden husk is gone, what you get is this deep red looking grain, which is why some call this rice African red rice. And by at least 3,000 years ago, it was being cultivated by civilizations living along the continent's third longest river, the Niger, West Africa's equivalent of the Nile. The biggest and baddest of these civilizations was an African empire known as the Jolof or Wolof Empire, a West African powerhouse which many Moors, black kings and generals from North Africa died trying to conquer, an empire which encompassed modern day countries like Senegal and the Gambia. But did you catch that name just now? The Jolof Empire. Yes, this red dish, jollof rice, has been behind a century-old war of words between Ghanaians and Nigerians about who cooks the best version. Funny thing is, jollof rice originated from neither Ghanaians or Nigerians. It belongs to the Senegalese, specifically the Wolof or Jolof people. But the Jolof Empire's legacy spreads further than you might think. If you're African-American and you're looking at the screen right now shouting, what are you talking about jollof? That there's nothing but glow, gullah, red rice. Well then I don't blame you because those keen eyes of yours are onto something. Stick around, we'll come back to this later, I promise. For now, let's stay in Africa. Because in the 15th century, white men arrived on the western coasts of the motherland and contrary to the Eurocentric myth that they found nothing but savages, what they actually found were thriving empires and kingdoms from megacities to towns, city-states to complex confederations of villages. These kingdoms had everything they needed right where they were and more. The sun, rich earth, natural resources, manpower and mind power. Listen to how the Portuguese described the riches they saw along the Upper Guinea coast in the 1400s. Gomez Ianes de Azuarara in 1446. The sailors said they found the country covered by vast crops with many cotton trees and large fields planted in rice. End quote. Geographer Valentin Fernandez, 1510. This land is rich in food, to wit, rice, millet and beans, cows and goats, chickens and capons and numerous wines and other food products. End quote. No starving African babies, not just yet, that wouldn't come till after hundreds of years of raping and pillaging by the West. Just saying. Back in the 14 and 1500s, however, the rice growing technology used by Africans was something European explorers had never seen before. And boy, did it confuse them. Another explorer, the mixed race Portuguese man Andres Alvarez de Almada, said this. Quote, in these parts, the rainy season starts at the end of April. The blacks make their rice fields in these plains. They construct dikes of earth for fear of the tides. But despite these dikes, the river breaks them frequently, flooding the rice fields. Once the rice has sprouted, they pull it out and transplant it on land that is inundated, where the rice yields. End quote. What Dalmada didn't realize was that the flooding was deliberate, part of the process of growing the rice. 
writer John M. West in 2012 commented that Dalmada seemed confused about the practice of transplanting, which could only be done in deep water rather than well-drained land. Mr. West points out that another century would pass before European explorers would finally get it. In 1685, Michel Jajolet de la Croube crossed the hinterland between the Gambia and Guinea-Bissau and he wrote this. I saw fields of rice located along the river. They are traversed by small walkways from space to space that prevents the water from running out. After it rains, one seeds the rice, which grows in the water. The lowlands and those that are watered by ordinary spillover from the heavy rains at the height of the season or inundated by springs or currents coming from higher up are all planted in rice. The people cut up their land by means of small dikes that retain water so that the rice is always bathed because it likes to be in the water and it grows as the water rises. The lands that are flat and well irrigated are perfectly cultivated and they do not use but shovels of wood provided with a flat piece of iron at one end and a long hand to cultivate." End quote. So millennia before the arrival of Europeans, Africans had found ways to turn their notoriously difficult terrains of wet jungle and mangrove coastlines into arable, farmable rice fields. Meanwhile, English ships were arriving on the east coast of America, their passengers disembarking and wondering what exactly to do with all the wet, marshy land they'd discovered. These are those same marshy plains of Georgia and the Carolinas. Today, not far from here are towns, gated communities and shopping malls. The gentrification nowadays, it's thick and fast. But when the first Europeans came here, nobody lived anywhere near these plains apart from several well-adapted nations of Native Americans. Back then, Europeans didn't know what to do with all this real estate, just that they had to dispossess the Indians of it. By the early 1700s, however, somebody had had an idea. We don't know who exactly was the first to think of it, but having observed what the Africans were doing across the Atlantic with their forests, it was soon clear what needed to be done in the south. Rice. But how to grow it? Nobody knew how to, except the Africans. And so the first enslaved people were brought over from the old world to the new, specifically for the job of using their special skill set and knowledge to reshape the landscape their kidnappers couldn't work. Many of these enslaved men and women were from the Kingdom of Angola, a name which came to be shortened to Gola. These slaves were mixed with many others coming from what was known then as the Windward Coasts or Rice Coasts, places like Guinea, Senegal, Sierra Leone and Nigeria. All were lumped into one group and that group collectively became the Gola Nation. But Gullah ancestors didn't just bring their pain and tears, they brought their ways, their knowledge and strength. They brought with them the life and death knowledge of rice planting. And they also brought their culture. Many words in the English language today are owed to these people. Okra, coming from the Igbo word for the vegetable, okuru. Yam from Inyame or Inyambi, the Wolof word for the same. And Barracuda from the Yoruba word for sharp. Akurakuda. The Gola dialect is itself a type of Creole which when the old heads speak it sounds uncannily like Jamaican Patois. Of course, the dialect is also closely tied to its African roots and attentive Africans can hear some words still used in the pidgin spoken in West Africa today. And so, from just a couple hundred in the late 1600s to over 3,000 by 1708, these Africans soon became the majority population in Georgia and the Carolinas, and they would soon make it count. In 1739, a carefully planned slave rebellion killed over 20 white colonists. The Gullahs never seemed closer to freedom than at that point in time, but without a common language, sold off from disparate African nations, the organization needed to make the uprising successful was lacking and the Gullah Rebellion was eventually brutally suppressed. Still, colonial America was afraid, 
so afraid that in 1740, something known as the Negro Act was passed, placing a short-term moratorium on importing slaves from Africa. This moratorium was eventually lifted. It had to be. It was the only way the colonists could build something out of land that oozed and breathed, land they knew nothing about, but that the Africans knew exactly how to use. Besides, Carolina gold and the knowledge of growing it was becoming so in demand that the governor of Carolina complained in a letter that they had more rice to ship out than there were ships. Nice problem you got there. Wanna swap? is what the slaves would have said if they'd spoken the governor's language. As more black men and women arrived, more rice was produced. The crop went from 330 tons exported in 1700 to 42,000 tons in 1770 in South Carolina alone. Plot these numbers on a graph and you'll see the success, livability and growth of the South go up in sync with the increase of black arrivals decade after decade. Jean M. West writes, quote, These Africans brought knowledge from their homelands of different modes of rice cultivation, soil and water management and milling, which they adapted to the rice plantations of the southeast, such as using hollow cypress log trunks to control the flow of water from levees into fields. One 18th century source would write, Rice is raised so as to buy more Negroes, and Negroes are bought so as to get more rice. Now we all know of how profitable cotton was, but rice plantations produced profits of up to 26%, leading one Savannah River planter to describe his rice fields as gold mines. A Charles Manigo invested $49,500 on a plantation in 1833, and by 1861, that same plantation was worth $266,000. In today's money, that's about $3 million more than quintupled in less than three decades. And that calculation doesn't account for buying power today in real terms. From the 18th century to the Civil War, slaves planted, tended and harvested the crops that made plantation owners wealthy. And Georgetown County, South Carolina, the second largest rice producer in the world. Those words were from the article, When Rice Was King. But while the money was being made, in caskets, the laborers were not being laid. Thousands of Africans died in the quest to grow Carolina gold, many sinking and drowning in the marshy mud of the South Carolina lowlands. Rice planting in the South was hard work, mentally and physically, if you could survive it work that without realizing what they were admitting to, some southern observers would confess was tantamount to building the pyramids. Charleston merchant Samuel Evely said in 1735, I am positive that this commodity can't be produced by white people. Because the work is too laborious, the heat very intense, and the whites can't work in the wet at that season as Negroes do. Side note, We've been saying this about the pyramids. You can't build all this, paint yourself looking like this, wearing nothing but your birthday suit under the blazing African sun, and all the while, you really look like this. Nah, them folks were black. Stop the cap. I mean, cap. Well, look at that there dictionary. Cap works too. But let's look more closely at what this work involved. John M. West in his 2012 article describes the sausage-like process of just how gullers built the economy of the South. Quote, An acre of mudflats would be measured into a rectangular field. Slaves would clear the land, chopping down and burning or removing any trees. Oxen were the only draft animals that might be used to assist, but they had to wear a special boot or else they would sink in the muck. Using only picks and shovels, slaves excavated a 5 by 5 foot ditch through the clearing that would serve both as the canal that brought tidal waters to the field and its main drain. The slaves used the muddy soil they had excavated to form a levee as high as 6 feet tall around the field. Slaves constructed sluice gates, first of cypress plug trunks and later hanging floodgates, to drain the water from the field for sowing and flooding it for cultivation. Typically, the following season, the field would be divided into four L-acre sections. 
Slaves added water drains, secondary canals, and cleared stumps. With the extra weight of water-laden soil, the danger of snakes and alligators that had been stranded behind the levee, mosquitoes, and hot summer temperatures, the slaves' work was dangerous and exhausting." End quote. Gullahs used wooden mortars and pestles to mill the rice, a practice they brought from Africa, a practice reminiscent of how Egyptians processed their famous farro grain, similar to how other Africans have processed their grains and tubers since forever. Separating the holes from the grain with winnowing baskets, the making of which once again utilized the intricate skills their ancestors brought over from Africa, an account from 1775 reports what happened next. Quote, when winnowed, it is ground to free the rice from the husk. This is winnowed again and put into a mortar large enough to hold half a bushel, in which it is beat with a pestle by Negroes to free it from its thick skin. This is very laborious work. Close quote. Laborious and deadly work. One 18th century source confessed, if a work could be imagined peculiarly unwholesome and even fatal to health, it must be that of standing like the Negroes, ankle and mid-leg deep in water which floats an oozy mud and exposed all the while to a burning sun which makes the air they breathe hotter than the human blood. These poor wretches are then in a furnace of stinking putrid effluvia. This is not even a fraction of the horrors involved. A runaway slave, Charles Ball, reported, quote, Watering and weeding the rice is considered one of the most unhealthy occupations on a southern plantation, as the people are obliged to live for several weeks in the mud and water, subject to all the unwholesome vapors that arise from stagnant pools, under the rays of a summer sun, as well as the chilly autumnal dews of night. Close quote. Charles Ball would also report in his famous book of how runaway slaves hanged themselves rather than return to their kidnappers' plantations. Up to a third of low country slaves died within a year of their arrival. Records from Somerset Place Plantation in North Carolina indicate that 80 fit, young and strong Africans were brought there in June 1786 to transform the land into a rice plantation. By 1803, only 15 were still alive. At Gowrie Plantation in South Carolina during an eight-year period between 1846 and 1854, more slaves died than were born. 90% of the infants who survived birth died before they were 16 years old. And yet, somehow, a little like the Israelites in Egypt, the Gullahs managed to increase in number. So much so that by the time of the Civil War in the 1860s, blacks were the single largest ethnic group across the Carolinas and Georgia, comfortably surpassing the whites. Could it have been something in the water or food even? Not when you think nutrition, clothing and shelter typically were often very poor. But out of something bitter, Gola men and women made something sweet. The South owes some of its best-loved cuisines today to the ancestors of Gullah Americans. With the gardens they kept, sometimes secretly, sometimes with the permission of their masters, the Gullah people grew vegetables from their home countries and passed on their African recipes, one generation to another. Gullah red rice is almost unchanged in its look and taste from what West Africans know as jollof rice. And if it's as delicious as the connoisseurs say, then no doubt it's of the Nigerian variation. Then there's okra soup, gizzard stews, gola rice and beans known as hopping johns. There's literally history in every plate of gola food. Incredibly, the soil ran out of steam before gola men and women did. It became depleted just as new rice growing regions were opening to the west of America. But most crucially, the civil war happened and thankfully the right side won, thereby abolishing slavery in America. After having been banned from trading with England and its colonies during that war, the plantation owners in the south couldn't recover even with the war over. And without the slave labor needed to farm it and make the crop profitable, Carolina gold quickly lost its luster for southern planters. 
at the end of the Civil War as part of the US government's reconstruction plan, lands on the coastal islands were sold to the newly freed Africans. But this goodwill hasn't lasted. Once again, Gullah folk are being deported, but this time not by slave ships, this time by gentrification. This gentrification started in the 1900s, when land on some of the islands on the southeast were turned to resorts and drilling fields. This gentrification and illegal sale-off of Gullah land continues today. If America ever was great, and Americans really want to make the country great again, you all might want to do it properly this time round and not leave behind those on whose backs and minds that greatness was built. People whose descendants are the likes of Jim Brown, Robert Smalls, Clarence Thomas, Earl Manigo, James Jameson, Joseph Rainey and Smoking Joe Fraser. All hail the Gullah Nation. From Cush to Compton, this has been Trill Black. Thank you.